Hello guys and welcome back to the second part of a five-part lecture series over blood. Today we're going to be going over white blood cells and then we're going to draw a focus to the differential white blood cell count. As always, I've provided you with a set of learning objectives to help guide you through the lecture. Also, if you're in my class, I would have your lecture handout out and available to take notes on and answer questions about the different learning objectives or I'd have it up and available in a digital format. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. Objective number one, terminology. So there are going to be terms that I use throughout the course of the semester, and I'd like you to just understand their basic meaning. The first one is antigen. Whenever I use the term antigen, I am talking about anything that triggers an immune response. So an antigen is literally anything that triggers an immune response. It could be bacteria, it could be viruses, fungi, parasite, toxins from something like a snake bite or the external environment. And in rare cases of disease, it could be your body's own tissue if you have something like an autoimmune disease. So an antigen is just anything that triggers an immune response. An antibody, a.k.a. an immunoglobulin, so if you ever see capital I, lowercase g, that stands for immunoglobulin, if you're ever looking, for example, at lab work, those are antibodies. And antibodies are a group of plasma proteins that play an important role in immune response. So whereas antigens can trigger an immune response, antibodies are the immune response. When white blood cells called plasma cells come into contact with antigens, it could be bacteria, virus, uh, the, you know, cancerous tissue, whatever it is, whatever's triggering that immune response, these cells produce antibodies, right? So these cells produce antibodies. Antibodies then target antigens for destruction. So whereas antigens are the things that trigger the immune response, antibodies are the immune response. So when you think about some of the functional roles of antibodies, Antibodies can, let's say that these are viruses, let's say this is COVID-19 floating around cells and it's binding to that ACE receptor. Antibodies can literally bind to and neutralize or inactivate viruses. So you'll see this virus is coated with antibodies that can no longer infiltrate cells. In fact, when we're looking for the presence of viruses in the body, whether somebody suffered a viral infection, we don't often look for the virus itself. We don't do DNA analysis. I mean, you can, but we don't often do that. An easier way and a cheaper way is to look for the antibodies. So you've heard a lot about antibody testing probably with COVID-19. Antibodies can also activate what's called the complement system. When antibodies pin to an antigen, so here are the protein antibodies, they were produced by a white blood cell, and they're binding to this bacterial cell, and they're activating what are called the complement systems. Complement systems come and essentially punch holes in that bacterial cell, it splits open, and it dies. Antibodies can also be flags that tell other immune cells called phagocytes. And remember, oh, well, we haven't talked about that yet. So monocytes turn into phagocytes after they migrate out of the cardiovascular system into a tissue. And phagocytosis is cell eating. So a phagocyte is just a big white blood cell that goes around and gobbles things. When this phagocyte comes into contact with a bacterial cell that's been pinned with antibodies, it recognizes those as a marker that says eat that thing. That's not part of self. We need to destroy it. So antibodies serve an array of functional roles. Now what we're talking about today, learning objective two, are types of leukocytes and their relative abundance. A leukocyte is a white, so leuco means white and cyte means cell. A leukocyte is a white blood cell. Now if you think back to the previous lecture, Whole blood is a suspension mixture that separates out based on density. That middle layer is called the Buffy coat. Less than 1% of whole blood consists of white blood cells and platelets. And of that 1%, let's just call it 1% that consists of white blood cells, each of the white blood cells have a different abundance or a relative ratio, meaning they're present in different amounts. So there's a good mnemonic for that that we're going to talk about, but first we're going to distinguish the first two broad categories of white blood cells. The first broad category are granulocytes. Granulocytes get their name because under a microscope, when they're stained, they have easily observed granules in their cytoplasm, so they look grainy, right, under a light microscope. You'll notice that all the granulocytes have the suffix phils, P-H-I-L-S. That's Greek for philos, it means loving. So neutrophils are granulocytes that love neutral stain. Eosinophils 
are granulocytes that love a stain called eosin, which is an acidic stain, and eosin stains always stain really, really red. Basophils are um, leukocytes that really love basic stains. Basic stains stain really, really blue, purple, really dark blue, purple colors. And sometimes these stains are so abundant, right? Those granules are so abundant that they mask the nuclei. Sometimes all you can see is the granules within those granulocytes. Agranulocytes, on the other hand, don't have readily observed granules under a light microscope. Now, if you did an electron microscope, it'd be a different story, but under a light microscope, they don't. And notice that the suffix there is site. So we have lymphocytes and monocytes. Now, when you think which are the most abundant white blood cells and which are the least abundant of that 1%, there's a good mnemonic to always remember that, and it's never let monkeys eat bananas. The most abundant is going to be neutrophils, followed by lymphocytes, followed by monocytes, followed by eosinophils, followed by basophils. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at each of the different types of white blood cells. Before we do that, whereas we went over erythropoiosis in the previous lecture where we were focusing on red blood cells, Another process that takes place within the red bone marrow, right? So you have bone, you have spongy bone, that porous matrix. In there you have red bone marrow, and that red bone marrow is comprised of what are called hematopoietic stem cells. So hematopoiosis is the production of formed elements, right? It means the formation of blood. So red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets are all made in that bone marrow. When you think about the cells that they all derive from, they're called hematopoietic stem cells. And stem cells are unique because they can become any cell. So when a stem cell becomes, for example, an eosinophil, right, that process by which a stem cell matures into an adult cell that serves a function, that process is called differentiation. So when I say a hematopoietic stem cell differentiates into. Now, when you look at hematopoietic stem cells, they can either become myeloid stem cells in their pathway. Myeloid stem cells will form granulocytes, or they can become lymphoid stem cells. Lymphoid stem cells will always form agranulocytes. What triggers these stem cells to actually become white blood cells is what's called colony stimulating factor. So white blood cells floating around in the, or in the cardiovascular system or in your tissues come into contact with an infection. They go, that's an antigen and we got to target it. But we need a little bit of backup. So these white blood cells, each of them release a unique colony stimulating factor. Now you don't need to know the specific colony stimulating factors, but each white blood cell releases a unique co uh, colony stimulating factor. And what colony stimulating factors do is they trigger these stem cells to become white blood cells. Right, so whereas those stem cells could become red blood cells or platelets, in the presence of colony stimulating factor, they become white blood cells. So colony stimulating factors were actually a really important discovery for cancer therapies for reasons that I'm going to discuss in just a moment. Interleukins also contribute to hematopoiosis. They're not as important as colony stimulating factor, but they are important, and they also trigger differentiation into white blood cells. So if you've ever heard of the interleukin protein pathways, those are immune proteins. They play an important role in regulating immune responses, part of them being the formation of white blood cells in the red bone marrow. So when we think about this, here we have our hematopoietic stem cell, and it's called pluripotent because it can turn into literally anything right? Any of the formed elements, or anything really, but that's another discussion. So, and that's why you take bone marrow to do things like bone marrow, trans and anyway, well. So you have this pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell, right? And it can turn into anything. So in the presence of EPO, this cell is going to become a red blood cell, and it's going to go through that pathway we talked about in the previous lecture. In the presence of thrombopoietin, this cell is going to turn into a megakaryocyte, which is going to fragment to form a bunch of platelets. We're going to talk about that in lecture four. In the presence of colony stimulating factor, these pluripotent stem cells turn into white blood cells. The stimulus for the release of colony stimulating factors is infection or some kind of antigen, right? Something's gotten in that's triggered the immune response. 
these cells, these mature cells, come into contact with whatever it is they target, and if they come into contact with their particular antigen, they start releasing these colony stimulating factors. They travel through the blood, go to uh, the red bone marrow, bind to receptors, and trigger a pathway in which more of those cells are produced because they need a little bit of backup. So leukemias are essentially a dysregulation in the production of white blood cells in the red bone marrow. So when you're thinking about what constitutes aggressive leukemias as opposed to things like chronic leukemias, it depends on the degree of differentiation. If a stem cell starts to divide uncontrollably. So notice that these are undifferentiated cells. They don't have any defining characteristics. If stem cells start to divide uncontrollably, then those stem cells are literally going to push out every other cell in the red bone marrow. They don't actually serve a functional role. They're just there to divide, and they're going to abolish the function of the red bone marrow. Anemia is going to develop. Your immune system is going to collapse. You're going to feel like crap, and that's what leukemias are. And then they, of course, have the potential to metastasize into different tissues and become massively problematic. Stem cells will always, if the dysregulation and division is a stem cell, they will always be aggressive cancers, meaning they will spread quickly, they're highly malignant, they're prone to metastasis or spreading around the body. The further along this differentiation pathway, the less aggressive that cancer becomes. It's not that it's not serious, but the less aggressive that cancer becomes. So these two most aggressive because it's this guy at the top and then myeloid leukemia is a little bit less aggressive because we're further along the differentiation pathway lymphocytic leukemias or chronic leukemias are leukemias that stem essentially from adult cells and they be they tend to be a little bit less aggressive or cells further along the differentiation pathway for those of you who are sticklers on cancer biology but it's just a dysregulation of uh, the division of white blood cells and depending on where that dysregulation occurs will dictate how aggressive that particular cancer is. So when you think about treatments for cancer, all forms of cancer therapy are designed to remove or kill rapidly dividing cells. So if you get surgery, tumors are removed, you're getting rid of those rapidly dividing cells because the definition of a cancerous cell is just a cell that's always in mitosis. Right? So cancerous cells are constantly going through mitosis, they're dividing, but they don't do anything, so they just drown everything out, use resources, and eventually kill you. So radiation therapy, right, when you bombard a cancerous cell with radiation, what it does is it stops mitosis. Chemotherapies, which are medications that you take, like methotrexate, also stop mitosis. The problem with a lot of these treatments is you want to make them as specific as possible, and we're getting better at that, and there are new advances on the horizon, such as immunotherapies that are changing the way that cancer is treated. But the mainstay is still radiotherapy and chemotherapy. The problem with that is you're also killing healthy cells that are dividing rapidly. One of the areas where you see the most rapidly dividing cells is along the GI tract, and that's why ten people tend to have tummy problems and lose their appetite when they're going through like chemotherapy, for example. The hair, for example, falls out because those are rapidly dividing cells. Your skin gets thinner. Uh, and another thing that happens is the cells in the red bone marrow just go boom, right? kills all of them. They're rapidly dividing cells. So you become anemic, you become leukopenic, meaning that you have no energy, you're prone to infection, right? You can't clot blood very readily. But the discovery of these substances radically changed, right, how unpleasant it is to go through cancer therapies. Because now as somebody's going through chemotherapy, we can give them EPO to treat their anemia. We can give them TPO or do uh, blood transfusions for, uh, to make sure that they have enough platelets. We can give them colony stimulating factor to trigger their immune system or start um, upregulating the production of white blood cells. And that's a really, really important part of cancer therapies these days. It makes it, you don't see typically in at least in earlier stages what you used to associate with the traditional cancer patient quite as much anymore because we do have these ancillary therapies to protect other tissues in the body. So learning objective four, neutrophils. Oop. Neutrophils. 
are called such because the stain of the cytoplasm is relatively neutral. And key points, recognize neutrophil is given a description or a histological image. So neutrophils are relatively large cells. They're most easily right identified by the neutral staining granules, right? They're not really red or really blue, right? They're kind of in the middle. And what's called a multilobar nuclei. So you'll see here one, two, three, four lobes to that nuclei. It's not multiple nuclei. That nuclei just has different regions. So we refer to it as being a multilobar nuclei. The telltale anatomical characteristic of a neutrophil, if I say identify the cell type indicated by the pointer, neutrophil. Provide me two anatomical justifications, neutral staining granules and a multilobar nuclei. Any nuclei that has three to six lobes will be a neutrophil bottom line, right? Even if this stain is a little bit more red or a little bit more purple, if there's three to six lobes to that nuclei, it's a neutrophil. Neutrophils are the most abundant type of white blood cells we have, and that's good because they're the body's primary defense against bacterial infection. We are bombarded by bacterial uh, antigens all the time, potential pathogens in our food, right, floating around in the air and the water we drink. So it's good that we have a lot of neutrophils to target potentially dangerous bacteria. If neutrophil numbers are elevated, and we'll talk about this more in just a minute when we get to the differential white blood cell count, it's likely a bacterial infection. So when you look at how neutrophils function, I'm going to set up this slide. Here's a neutrophil. Here's diplococci gonorrhea bacteria. Neutrophils track bacteria. They carry out a process called chemotaxis, meaning they don't just float around, they actively hunt. And what this neutrophil is doing is it's hunting that bacteria and it's engulfing it. It's phagocytizing it. It's then going to incorporate it into a little lysosome and a group of proteins called defensins are going to break this bad boy down. So if you think about studies where they evaluate, you know, the, the researchers are evaluating like the aggressiveness of a white blood cell. You know, I, I once read a study that was talking about how blueberry extract or blueberries make your immune system or augment your immune system. And what they were counting as aggressiveness of white blood cells is they plated these white blood cells with bacteria and they literally were just counting how many you know, bacteria the white blood cells ate in, in a, an agar plate with no blueberry extract and an agar plate with blueberry extract. So it's interesting. Now, eosinophils are a little bit different. So be able to recognize eosinophils given a description or a histological image. Eosinophils have a really red stain to the granules in their cytoplasm. Extraordinarily red stain. Eosin is a red stain. It's an acidic stain that stains red. And they tend to have bilobar nuclei. If you see that really red stain, you are looking at an eosinophil. Unlike uh, neutrophils, eosinophils are our body's primary immune defense against parasitic infections. Parasitic infections are infections in which the cells that make up an organism, they're either multicellular parasites like tapeworm, ringworm, blood flukes, or they're single cell parasites like amoebas, but those cells have the same machinery that our cells do, meaning they're eukaryotic cells. They have like mitochondria, etc. Right? So antibiotics don't work against parasites, and that's why they can be so problematic to get rid of. So eosinophils target parasitic infections. Elevated numbers of eosinophils likely indicate a parasitic infection. So when you think about how eosinophils target parasitic infections, this is a blood smear here, and what you're looking at is a blood fluke. It's a worm in the blood, essentially, a little parasitic worm that gets injected from snails and like rice patties. And what's happening is these eosinophils are rushing this, and they have a little protein spear that goes, right? And all these eosinophils rush this uh, parasitic worm like a, you know, inmates in a prison yard and they just shank the cells and those cells pop open and pop open and pop open and if you kill enough of the cells, the organism will die and it'll be swept by other components of the immune system. Basophils, on the other hand, are our least abundant white blood cell. Their <clears throat> cytoplasm stains very, very, very dark purple, right? Right? 
So they're big cells and their cytoplasm stains very, very dark purple with this bilobar nuclei. A lot of times with basophils, those granules are so densely packed around that nuclei that you don't even see that nuclei. So you get that really dark purple blue or purple stain. And what basophils do is they produce a protein or a little signaling molecule called histamine. And what histamines do is they mediate um, inflammatory responses. So they do things like dilate capillaries so more blood can rush to a region. They attract more white blood cells. Everything you associate with inflammation, right? Histamines mediate that. They, hit, they mediate inflammatory responses. And inflammation is really important if you have something like an infection. One of the problems, though, is when basophils migrate into different tissues, like up in your sinus cavity, and they start producing histamines in response to things like pollen, which are inert and don't have any potential to destroy your body, but the immune system reacts anyway, that histamine release can be awfully unpleasant. So whereas we treat bacterial infections with antibiotics, parasitic infections with antiparasitics, we treat basophil-mediated reactions with antihistamines, which bring down that inflammation. So if you see basophils elevated in the system, it could be indicative of something like an allergic response. It's not the only thing, but it's a pretty common thing. Now what you're looking at here is a process called degranulation, and this is a really interesting test that's being done. So I don't know if any of y'all have heard of tests, blood tests, to look for things like um, allergens to see if you're allergic to certain substances. But this is one method that you can do those blood tests. And what's happening here is they've isolated some basophils and they've plated them in a, in a plate where they have access to looking at what they're doing, right? So they're using this clever imaging technique and they can see the basophils responding to things. Then they introduce a potential allergen. So let's say um, cedar pollen, right? So you throw cedar pollen in there. Well, if these basophils start reacting to that cedar pollen and cranking out these histamines, that's a positive sign that you're probably allergic to that. So elevated numbers mean an allergic reaction. Now we're on learning objective five through eight now. Learning objective seven is lymphocytes. Key points, definitely be able to recognize a lymphocyte given an image or a written description. Lymphocytes are medium-sized white blood cells. And one of the things that you notice, one, you don't see those granules because these are agranulocytes within the cytoplasm. And two, you get this gigantic nuclei that takes up the overwhelming majority of the volume of the cell. Right, And that's because in the nuclei we have DNA, DNA to RNA, RNA to protein. These guys crank out proteins like crazy. So you see this large spherical nuclei with a cytoplasm halo, a very small amount of cytoplasm relative. Now, lymphocytes, I would argue, in many respects, are the most important type of white blood cell, and that's because they mediate what's called adaptive immunity, or you know, immunity in which memory cells can form. So when you talk about the immune system, which we will in later sections, you're really talking about lymphocytes. And there are body's only defense against viral infections and against cancerous cells. So you've everybody has had cancer at some point. It's just that your immune system has gone and swept it out. And in fact, one of the most um, important things you can do to prevent cancer is to make sure that you bolster your immune system in whatever way you can. Now, the granulocytes have a relatively short lifespan. So the neutrophils, um, eosinophils, basophils, they come into contact with things and they live anywhere from zero to nine or, you know, from one to nine days. Lymphocytes, on the other, can have really, really long lifespans, right? So they can have really, really long lifespans and they're the body's only de defense against viral infection and cancers. So these lymphocytes go around, they, uh, survey, they carry out surveillance or they're sentinels for, you know, uh, viral infections or virally infected cells. They're also there to identify cells that have undergone cancer's changes and try to sweep them out before those cells proliferate too much. And those are kind of, that's kind of the basis of immunotherapy. Now there are two types of lymphocytes I want you to know. There are B lymphocytes and there are T lymphocytes. So B lymphocytes 
work in a very interesting way, and I'm going to focus your attention up here first. So we're going to focus up here first, right? Now, you'll notice that when this starts over, let's call this COVID-19, and this B lymphocyte comes into contact with COVID-19. That activates these lymphocytes, and these lymphocytes start to divide to make even more and more B lymphocytes. Some of these B lymphocytes will stick around in the immune system and they'll become what are called memory cells and the other will actively target this infection. They target this infection by cranking out proteins called antibodies. So if you see here, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is just cranking out antibodies and those antibodies will actually right, bind to and neutralize and cause uh, bacterial or viral infect pathogens to agglutinate or clump together. So here's the antibody binding to and clumping these guys together and deactivating these viruses. That's why the antibody response with COVID-19 is so important. It's the, it is the immune response. T lymphocytes, on the other hand, are a little bit different. So B lymphocytes carry out what's called humoral immunity or antibody-mediated immunity. Think of it as antibody-mediated immunity. And what they do is they don't destroy cells. They target these little antigens, things like viruses, when they're floating around in the body's fluids, in the blood plasma and in the interstitial fluid. So those antibodies don't destroy any cells. They just target those little viral pathogens when they're floating around. That's called antibody-mediated immunity. T lymphocytes carry out what's called cell-mediated immunity. And in cell-mediated immunity, what you're looking at here is a T lymphocyte coming into contact with a cancerous cell. Now, what T lymphocytes do is they actually kill cells. So B lymphocytes produce antibodies which neutralize things like viruses outside of the cell in the body's fluids. T lymphocytes recognize cells that have become cancerous or infected with a virus and they kill cells. They destroy entire cells, and it's called cell-mediated immunity. Now, the final type of white blood cell we're going to talk about are monocytes. Monocytes are very large white blood cells. You don't see those distinct granules in the cytoplasm, and they have this kidney bean-shaped nuclei. When they leave the cardiovascular system, like all white blood cells do, the, the cardiovascular system, the blood is just a way for these guys to get around to the different tissues in your body. But when a tissue has some kind of infection, it sets out little flags that the white blood cells latch onto and then they migrate out of the cardiovascular system. When monocytes migrate out of the cardiovascular system, they're called macrophages or phagocytes. And what they do is they just go gobble things up they're like the cleaning crew, and they typically become elevated in response to multiple different infections because they come in after everything and just gobble up cellular debris or antibody-pinned bacteria or whatever it is, or antibody-pinned cells that have become, you know, infected or what, whatever it is. So you see this guy just gobbling things up. Bleep, bleep, bleep. Bleep. No. So when we do a differential white blood cell count, essentially what we're doing is we're taking what's called a blood smear. So we take, uh, we prick our finger, we take a little smear of blood, and we put it in three different stains that stain red blood cells and white blood cells. And this is the type of image you'd get. Now with a differential white blood cell count, typically you count all of the white blood cells on your slide and you typically count them up to 100, but if you don't have 100, you just count as many as you have. And you'll go, that's the total number of white blood cells. That's my total count. Then you count the number that consists of, for example, neutrophils. You go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then you divide the number of neutrophils by the total number of cells to get a percent. Now, neutrophils should be 60 to 70 percent of the white blood cells present in a normal healthy system. Right? If I say neutrophils are elevated or neutrophils are depressed, that means that they fall out of that reference range. Now, you don't have to memorize that reference range. You just have to understand how to read this. And we're going to be doing a differential white blood cell count in lab. Now, when you're looking, for example, at a blood lab, 
you can count those manually and that's what they used to do in clinical labs or in clinical pathology labs and you can see well white blood cells are high and oh neutrophils are high so let's say your patient came in with something like you know they have this respiratory infection that won't go away and they feel really under the weather and you go I think I know what's going on but let's confirm that with a lab test you run a CBC a chem panel a uh, complete blood count, which is this, a chem panel, which is looking at things like the concentration of electrolytes and different enzymes, and a differential white blood cell count. And that differential white blood cell count is going to give you re your relative percentage or whatever metric of the different white blood cells, and you see that this is elevated. Well, neutrophils only become elevated in response to bacterial infections. Well, that's not entirely true, but for this class, sure. And... You go, oh, okay, that's a bacterial infection. That's a likely bacterial infection. So you treat with something like an antibiotic. Now, you see this automated differential? This is the way we do it in class. The way it's actually done is essentially you prep your blood, you put it into this analyzer. Different types of cells have different absorptive um, characteristics so you put it through this machine based on the absorptive characteristics it comes out gives you an automated readout this machine's probably linked to Wi-Fi and that message is probably sent directly to whatever